Hi there, and welcome to Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins, your host. Thanks for joining us as we explore the world of cybersecurity. If you've not seen this show before, let me tell you a little bit about it. Cybersecurity Today is the only TV show dedicated to tackling the subject of computer security in an exciting and thought-provoking manner. Cybersecurity Today is a 30-minute program that uses a talk show newscast format to discuss themes, topics, and current events in the cybersecurity space. If you're not familiar with cybersecurity, this show will provide you insight into how to protect and defend computer systems. For those viewers who are current practitioners, this show will provide you thought leadership from cyber experts on the direction of the cybersecurity industry. We aim to provide useful information to a full spectrum of interested parties. Now, let's talk a little bit about the breakdown of the show itself. The way we have it broken down is to two basic segments. We'll have our first segment called Cyber Bytes. This segment covers current events that are occurring today in the cybersecurity industry and market. Then, in our second segment, we'll have a cybersecurity practitioner come on the show and talk about something called the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, or known as CMMC. Mr. John Janik, Chief Technologist of Dev Technology Group Incorporated, is going to come in and provide an overview of the CMMC program and his perspective on what it means to the organization he works for, specifically Dev Technology Group. If you've not heard about the CMMC, it's a Department of Defense requirement that's being imposed on hundreds of thousands of contracting companies that support the DOD to ensure that those respective contractor computer systems meet certain security requirements for the protection of what we call controlled unclassified information, sometimes called CUI. This means that John's company, as well as hundreds of thousands of other companies will be required to meet the requirements of the CMMC program if they want to continue to support the Department of Defense from a contracting perspective. We've asked John to come in because we're interested in getting his take on how it will impact the contracting space and what opportunities and threats the CMMC program might represent to those who work for the Department of Defense. Okay, let's get into our first segment sometimes known as the Cyberbyte segment. So, in current news, a ransomware attack that was recently levied against the Los Angeles United School District just got worse. You may have heard about this. TechCrunch reports that a group that took credit for the heist, known as Vice Society, has published a 500 gigabyte data cache from the early September breach. The collection of this information that was breached and disclosed includes extremely sensitive details like social security numbers, bank account information, and health data that extends to students' psychological profiles. Vice Society, the organization that is responsible for this exploitation and, and, and disclosure of information, had given uh, the Los Angeles uh, School District until October 4th to pay a ransom. It's not clear what prompted the hackers to release the data early, but they alleged that the United States Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency wasted our time and was wrong to tell the district to reject the extortion attempt. CISA, the FBI, and other agencies have told historically ransomware victims don't pay the ransoms uh, and simply because it simply encourages hackers to look for more targets and it doesn't guarantee that the data can be restored. In other news, legislation seeking to address open source software risks in government has been introduced by Senators Gary Peters, a Democrat from Michigan, and Rob Portman, a Republican from Ohio. The Securing Open Source Software Act of 2022 legislation comes after a hearing convened by Peters and Portman on the Log4j uh, incident earlier this year. The legislation would direct CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, to develop a risk framework 
to evaluate how open source code is used by the federal government as well as evaluate how the same framework could be used by critical infrastructure owners and operators to further identify vulnerabilities in open source. Our third story talks specifically about a uh, Russian state actor. In January of 2022, CISA issued an alert warning that a Russian state-sponsored actor uh, was targeting so-called cleared defense contractors, sometimes called CDCs, in attacks designed to steal sensitive U.S. defense information and technology. The CISA alert described the attacks as targeting a wide swath of, of CDCs, including those involved in developing combat systems, intelligence and surveillance technologies, weapons and missile systems, and combat vehicles and aircraft designs. Those are the headlines that are making news. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be back with our guest, Mr. John Janik from Dev Technology Group and talk to him about the CMMC program. We'll see you in just a moment. Thank you. As an American, I'm proud of the men and women in our armed forces who every day protect our freedom. That's why I'm also proud to support Help Hospitalize Veterans, a nonprofit organization that offers veterans free therapeutic arts and craft kits specially designed to help them in their recuperation. The kits can also help veterans coping with depression or PTSD. To receive a free kit, call this number or visit hhv.org on the web. Thank you. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. For our second segment, we're being joined by Mr. John Janik from the Dev Technology Group Incorporated. John, welcome to the show. Hey Jim, glad to be here. So I appreciate you coming in and sharing your thoughts on the CMMC program. And I thought maybe what we could do is start off with just uh, talk a little bit about what the CMMC is, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. You know, undoubtedly we're gonna have members in our audience that have never heard of it before, so maybe you can provide just a quick overview of it. For yeah, me. sure. So the CMMC program is, and first off, a little bit of context. You know, I represent Dev Technology Group. We're a provider of services to the federal government. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in this role is, is from my perspective, somebody who has to implement CMMC. There's lots of different roles in this program, and it really kind of goes all the way back to the first implementation and requirements around the Defense uh, Federal Acquisition Regulations. And it, there was a, it's like somewhere between 2012 and 2015, I can't remember the exact dates, but there was, a, there was a requirement to implement some basic security into your program set for delivery around controlling information. So the government wants to be assured that when they hand you a piece of information that they consider sensitive for official use only, for sensitive, whatever you want to call it, right, the current categorization is controlled and classified information, but when they give you that information, which can include things as simple as contract information that's included in the contracts that they make with the, uh, with the private sector, that information has to be protected. And so the original guidance in the 800-171, which was published by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, or NIST, helped kind of guide some basic implementation guidance around that. The DOD decided at some point that that wasn't enough, that that wasn't going far enough to protect the information to the same level that they would expect out of themselves. And so they created a program to help accelerate that security parameters, parameterization, right, to help kind of build out that environment so that they could be assured that when information was transmitted to a contractor, to a partner whom they were working with, that they would be held to some kind of high security standard. Now, there's a couple of different reasons for this, and we've learned this especially over the past few years, that uh, sovereign state actors have been specifically, and you mentioned this in your, in your news briefs as well, they've been targeting government contractors because they know that the government has finally gotten to a point in its particular positioning and, and its technological you know, maturity that it's defeating most of those attacks on a regular basis. So where do you go next? You go where the security is weakest, right? It, you're going to go to where you can get in. And that turned out to be the contracting. So when we talk about things, you're gonna hear terms like CMMC, which stands for the program. You're gonna hear terms like 800-171, which is what CMMC builds on and continues to reference even in the new version that I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about. You're gonna hear terms like the DIB, the DIB, the Defense Industrial Base, right? You're gonna hear terms like the DIB-CAC, all these kind of acronyms, but at the end of the day, there's really three groups of people that this affects. 
This affects the DOD contracting staff who are working on actually making sure the delivery requirements are met and that contracts are issued on a reasonable terms and reasonable basis. This is going to affect the people in the CMMC system who are responsible for issuing accreditation, especially for level three and four. There's a lot of conversations around level two because it splits into between uh, self-assessment and C uh, three CPAO assessment. And then you're going to hear folks like me who are on the receiving end of all that and have to actually make something happen to get to a point where, where we can actually be effective. And all of that's been changing. And it's been, it's been kind of underway since 2019. And it has basically changed uh, on a fairly regular basis since that point, which is not a bad thing. I think, I think the DOD figured out that there was a lot that they needed to learn and iterate on. And so they've been doing that over the past few years. Okay, so you, let me unpack some of that. Yep. Let me go back to a real simple question because yeah. you talk about information, yep. right? I want to make sure just for our audience we have an understanding because you talk about controlled and classified information, yep. but you also use sensitive but unclassified. So yep. there's all these terms like FOUO, yep. SBU, CUI. Yep. Is it all the same, or is it is it is it is it consolidating now, or is it is it is it is still going to be d d disparate in terms of it? What's so, what's how, how does how, how do you envision that CMMC, CM, CMMC is going to deal with all of this disparity? Well, so CMMC doesn't deal with the information classification at all. That's an executive order. I can't remember the number right off the top of my head, but what happened was that you know and you know this right. There was for a long time a national security executive order that managed the difference between what we considered national security information and everything else. What we determined is that sometimes everything else can be sensitive, right? It doesn't fall under the executive order for national security information, so it doesn't have to be highly protected. And so you mean classified then, right? When usually, we say national yeah, security usually, for the most part, yes, correct? Yes, usually okay. you're going to hear that in terms of classified information, correct. right? So yep. when you hear about what's going on down in Mar-a-Lago with all that information, that is national security information that's highly classified. It falls under that executive order But for that's protection. not what we're talking about but that's here. That's not what we're talking correct. about here. Okay, what we're good. talking about here is the other information that over the years, people determined that there was some sensitivity to it. So I'll give you a couple of good examples. Building drawings are not classified information, right? They don't fall under national security most of the time. There's a few exceptions. But I think we can all agree that a drawing of a building is sensitive. It's very sensitive. Sure, sure. Very similarly, network diagrams, uh, even some contract information that shows up in your federal contract information, fund sites and how things are constructed and how things are obligated. This information isn't it doesn't fall under the executive for national security, but it does fall under a very severe impact to the government should it be used for nefarious purposes. So another executive order was issued. This is going back five, seven years, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but there was an executive order that was issued, said, you know what, we're gonna to gather together all these different kinds of information and label it controlled unclassified information. And so when you talk about for official use only, right? When you talk about sensitive but unclassified, when you talk about sensitive, right? When you talk about all these different labels, uh, these are different categories of information that are now all falling under the, the controlled unclassified information umbrella. And that's actually being managed out of the National Archives, right? So National NARA has the, uh, the lead on defining what that is and how it's made. NARA is the National Archives and Records Administration, right? So they have the lead on that and they're defining all that, all that good stuff. There's over, oh, I'm, I'm, somebody's gonna correct me on your show, I'm sure. There's well over a hundred categories of, sure, of CUI. Sure. So then, for you as a contractor, why does that matter? I mean, if you're dealing with government information, yeah. are they gonna provide information potentially to you in terms of operations as you're supporting them? Or is this just a compliance yeah. exercise that they want government contractors to go through? Yeah, so the great question. Uh, Dev Technology Group is a, is, a, is a technology firm for the US federal government, right? So we do technology modernization, we do application development, we do sustainment, we do you know all kinds of different things related to technology. As you can imagine, uh, and but we don't do weapon systems, right? So when you look at national security information that classified, the only thing that really is covered under classified development is weapon systems, right? Those things that are directly related to things that protect our borders and and make a, a significant difference in our day to day lives because they guarantee our freedom, right? Instead, what what we're facing with is all of these other systems that we support and all of the configuration information, all of the um, details on 
networking configurations and all of this other um, simply available information that if it gets out could be of significant risk to the US federal government because it provides malicious actors with insights, with, uh, with reconnaissance, with footprinting information, all kinds of stuff that could be used for, for very bad purposes, right? So, you know, in our context, CMMC matters to us because a lot of the information we deal with, it, we, we have to think about, okay, do we need to protect this now? Do we need to treat it differently? In our case, we're, we're very lucky in that most of our work is done for the government on government networks, and so it's kind of firewalled off, it's partitioned off. But there are, you know, we talked about federal contract information, FCI. This is one of the biggest groups of information that we're not entirely clear on, well, what is going to be considered FCI? And so far, the government's answer has been, we'll let you know. And that's really hard to plan for. Understood, understood. So, you know, you... Um, I know that CMMC has several different levels. Can you can you talk for a moment about those levels and, and ultimately how they would apply to different types of organizations? Yeah, sure. So originally there were five levels, and they kind of, if you can imagine, they again maturity is part of what CMMC stands for, right? The Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. So the idea was that we were going to help organizations go through a, a ever increasing security requirement from one to five, one being the minimal one, five being the most restricted one. What they realized was that was uh, incredibly detailed and incredibly difficult, right? And so they collapsed it from one to five to one to three. So now there's only three levels and essentially one remains kind of this basic entry level that they expect every member of the defense industrial base, and you mentioned it, hundreds of thousands of companies to meet. We'll get to that, I'm sure, at some point. Two is where companies like Dev and others will probably participate in where we deal with enough federal contracting information and other uh, CUI that we have to be aware and have to have the right controls in place in order to, to mitigate those effects. And three, where I think you're going to see a much smaller group of folks because at three, you're talking about uh, companies that are doing development for the government in their own spaces. Right, so at that point, we're really talking about the big organizations, right? We're talking about the Northrop Grumman's, the SIC's of the world, you know, folks who are literally doing development for the government in their own spaces, in their own laboratories, in their own offices. So who comes in and provides the assessment around, let's say, for dev technologies to demonstrate that they fall under one of those yeah. three levels? So that's a great question. Uh, one is going to be completely, you know, uh, self-assessment, right? You just have so to go level, through the level checklist. So level one is a self-assessment. Right. So if we've uh, got three levels, the first one is... The most basic one is basically you have to attest to the government that you have done these things, right? It's very basic, very straightforward. Two is going to be a little bit more interesting, and I, and I can't give you the latest because I haven't been in some of the most recent meetings, but I believe that we're still talking about splitting level two in, into two different buckets, a self-assessment and then a, what they call a third-party assessment organization. That's bucket, a 3PAO. Right? Three, three, yep, 3PAO, yep. right? So the, the challenge there is that there's a lot of ambiguity around, well, if I self-assess, is that good enough? What contracts are going to require actual third-party assessment? And, and even kind of how do we think about assessment in that context? Because the one thing we haven't really done, and I asked this question on a LinkedIn community discussion fairly recently, is we haven't really talked about what happens when the auditor and the subject matter expert disagree, right? So you and I have been friends for a while. You know that I have, um, what, 12 different cybersecurity certifications, somewhere between half a dozen to 12, I can't remember exactly how many. You know, um, I'm a big proponent of FITSI and, and all the other things that, that we've done. and. In that context, if an auditor comes and says, you didn't implement this correctly, and I said, I don't agree with how you're implementing it, there's no discussion on what that remediation looks like or how to actually come to an agreement on what it is. And this is one of the things that really concerns me because the idea that a third party audit can come into the organization and in a highly opinionated manner and make an assessment on an organization's readiness when we are in a technology state at the moment that is moving incredibly fast, I think is, in, is very risky, right? So what I mean by that, and I don't mean to, to, I don't mean to call anybody out, but it is gonna, the auditors for this program, this, the, three, the three PAOs are going to have to be so up on their game. Sure. Because I think you're going to have 
technology companies like ours that are going to say, we met these requirements, sure. and here's how we met these requirements. And just because how we met these requirements don't look like your assessment documentation doesn't mean we didn't meet the assessment requirement. And so you can't require us to do things that will either break or fundamentally you know, sacrifice or cause risk in our business uh, in order to meet your requirements. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought that, you know, the, the auditor's job is not to really validate the how of mm -hmm. the equation, but really the what. Yep. What did, 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 you know, in other words, take the requirement, it tells you what you have to accomplish, but it's not really the auditor's uh, prerogative or kind of space to tell you, uh, you know, um, is how you did it correct, right? Yep. In theory, they should just be ultimately validating that what you did was in alignment, whatever that requirement happens to be. Yeah, auditors should be partners, yep. not adversaries. That's right, that's right. All right, so uh, you know, you've talked about the three levels, you've talked about kind of at a high level with the program. Any idea yet on when they're going to come into effect, timeline? So, what are you guys seeing in terms of contract language out there? Well, for the, yeah, I mean, you're already seeing some, I think there are some contracts that have already been issued with the language in it, right? So again, this is not, and this is really important for everybody to hear. This isn't new. CMMC isn't new. CMMC has been around for a long time. What CMMC derives from, the NIST 800-171, has been a federal requirement now for almost a decade, years. So, so there's no excuse not to be implementing proper security. There's no excuse not to be looking through what's necessary in order to prepare your organization. I think, I think what we need to wait and see is how does the evolution of the 800-171 continue to happen. Right now it's going through a revision, there's a lot of conversation, there's an open comment period. The modification of the 171 underpins everything in, in the CMMC. So as you see the 171 continue to mature, and there's alignment there with the CMMC, I think a lot of the pressure from the CMMC AB, which is the accreditation board, is gonna come off because now it's actually NIST a federal agency that sets standards for the entire federal government that's being held responsible and accountable for this. And I, and I think now it's 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 CyberAB, right? Isn't that the name that's of it? That's right. CyberAB.org. Yep. So yep. if anybody's interested, they it used to be cmmc.ab.org. Now it's CyberAB.org. Yep. So, uh, and I think that's with the, the new move to the, the, the version two that you talked about, which was the three levels versus the five levels yep. as well. All right, um, so I'm, I'm curious relative to, to dev technologies, what kind of threats um, do you see that the CMMC program might have on your organization? Anything you guys have identified or are thinking about or concerned about relative well, to it? So I, I don't like the term threat, right? Because, you know, and I only say that because again, it's, 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 not, it's not a threat, it's a risk, right? So, so the risks that we see really really kind of boil down to how much are we going to have to spend to make sure that we're compliant, to make sure that we meet those, those necessary compliance requirements. And that's where I've been very much in the bucket of when the government figures out what they actually want and can, and can prove that it's necessary and actually useful, then we will, we will move from this 800-171 to whatever the next model is. And there's, again, a very small delta between those two things, especially at the one and the two levels, right? Three levels a little bit different. But I think one of the things that, that we really think about in terms of what are the risks to the organization or what is that cost? I was talking with another colleague in the industry and he said that his organization has already spent over $150,000 preparing for accreditation. I've talked to other organizations that have moved into secured enclaves away from commercial tenants, and that is that is a increased their costs substantially, and b actually reduced their ability to innovate for the government. And this is a huge risk, not only to the businesses that perform for the government, but for the government itself. One of the reasons why they send us business is because they know we can innovate and work faster than they can. And if they take that away from us, if they take that ability away from us to innovate and move quickly because they're suddenly concerned about where our data is processed, then we lose that effective edge and we lose that capability. I think there are ways to get to where we can need to be to continue to innovate, to continue to push the envelope without doing such severe uh, hard line, you must move into these secured enclaves. 
Understood. So you've talked about the risk side of it. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the opportunity side. Yeah. What kind of opportunities does dev technology see? And do you think that government contractors in general yeah. will be able to um, receive or obtain or, or, or pursue with the CMMC program? Yeah, so speaking very selfishly, of course, the, the, this, this reduces the ecosystem, the potential ecosystem for government contracts. Now, that's, that's a risk to most of this country. It's a benefit to the GovCon community, right? And that the people who will actually be able to compete for this work will, will shrink. And that's just a fact. I, I know that there are a lot of people that say, well, that's just not true. But the reality is there are companies that will exit federal work because they simply can't do it, right? And that's a shame. And that's something that I think we really do have to think about and how the government provides grants and how the government provides assistance and how the government provides funding. And there are lots of really good examples where the agencies have helped fund uh, ATO processes. FedRAMP's a really good example of that, where agencies have helped organizations take products, take services, and build them to standard using understanding that, that the commercial industry cannot bear these costs alone. The government has to take some responsibility for this. We've only got about 15 mm -hmm. seconds. I got one final okay. question for you. All right, where do you think the program will evolve into? Or w what are your thoughts in terms of if you have to kind of no. pr pr predict, how do you think things will evolve? It's gonna, it's gonna happen. I mean, it's been happening. My, my advice to everybody out there is, is if you haven't done 800-171 yet, you need to. You need to make sure your organizations are safe and secure. This stuff is no joke. There are companies and organizations that want to get into your business and want to know everything you do for the sake of having the data. And you talked about it, and it's only going to get worse. Thanks, John. All right, John. Hey, uh, we are out of time. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing your, your, your knowledge and your um, expertise in this space. Um, that's going to do it for today's episode. We hope you found the information presented in today's show useful and you learned something new about cybersecurity. We want to thank Mr. John Janik for coming in and sharing his expertise with us today. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the show and keep tabs on upcoming episodes, please check out our show's website at cybersecuritytoday.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.